Thank you all. Um, good evening. It is such a pleasure to be here. And thank you uh, to the Affinity Cultural Foundation for having me. Um, building bridges is something I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Um, and it sounds like you guys are doing some incredible work. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you to Ahmed and Barak as well for having me. Um, thank you as well to all of you for taking out some time on your Wednesday evening and coming and hearing me speak. Um, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting this evening, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I recognise that this land was never ceded and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as any Indigenous people in the room with us this evening. So my name is Kareem, I'm 23 years old. I do have a Siberian Husky who I was hoping to bring with me here to Sydney, um, but he is unfortunately back in Melbourne. Um, this year I also have the unique privilege of being Australia's youth representative to the United Nations for 2019. Uh, a, fan a fancy sounding title, but what does that actually mean? I will come to that in just a moment. For the last 10 days, I've had the pleasure of traveling around Sydney. In that time, I've run 17 workshops and have met with over 600 young people all over Sydney. I've also gotten to know your public transport system quite well, and I have to say I'm pretty impressed, especially by the trains and those adjustable seat backs that turn one row into two. I think we could use a bit of that in Melbourne. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the topic for today is what future young people want to build? Now, that's a big question. Uh, and I want to make clear right now that I don't have the answer to that question. Um, of course, I don't claim to speak for all young Australians, but what I can do is share with you what I've heard from the young people I've spoken with so far, share some of my observations and some of the stories that have come up through my consultations. My hope this evening is that we can have a positive discussion about where young people are currently at and how we can work together to ensure young people are given tangible opportunities to contribute to important conversations happening in society right now. I'm very much looking forward to hearing all of your ideas. So what is the Youth Representative Program? Well, for the past 20 years, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has partnered with the United Nations uh, Youth Australia to select a young person between the age of 18 and 25 to represent young Australians here at home and on the international stage. So what that actually looks like is over the next seven months, I will travel across the country, meeting with young people from all walks of life. I'll head to every state and territory from rural communities in the Northern Territory to the urban hearts of Melbourne and of course, Sydney. I'll run workshops with young people in schools, community groups, TAFEs, universities, juvenile detention centers, places of worship, and many other institutions where young people are central. We're hoping to personally meet and engage with over 20,000 young people this year, between the ages of 12 and 25. My goal in all of this is very simple, to listen. In every place I visit, I'll be looking to understand what issues young people care about and how they see their future. I will work to ensure those issues are heard by our leaders here in Australia and on the global stage. I won't push any agenda, nor will I go into these workshops with my own issues. The young people I speak to will have absolute control over where the conversation goes and what comes out of it. That's the key here. Young people having a space to lead their own conversations about what's most important to them and what will ultimately shape their future. This program believes in a very simple idea, that as young people, we're the next generation to inherit the world. So it's only fair that we should have a say in what that world looks like. The future is relevant to all of us, but it's particularly relevant to young people. That's why I'm here, oh, well, that's why this year I'm asking the question, what will our future look like if young people are heard today? Our program exists to amplify the voices of young people in Australia, to share their stories, their ideas, their solutions, and to capture their imagination. Alongside my listening tour, I'll meet with prominent members of the community, from MPs to NGO heads to leaders in industry and education, and of course, the media. In these meetings, I'll share what I've learned from the young people I've met and ensure their issues and their ideas are, are a part of the public conversation. In September, I'll head to the United Nations, um, where I will, or in New York, as an official member of the Australian delegation, where I'll advocate on behalf of young Australians and will bring attention to our issues on the global stage. I'll collaborate with other youth representatives and 
will deliver a speech at the end of October to the General Assembly on behalf of young Australians. When I come home, I'll spend the rest of the year essentially compiling what I've heard uh, from the young people I've spoken to, and we'll write up a report which, we, which will be delivered to the Australian government. In that report, I'll share all of the stories, all of the ideas, all of the solutions that have been developed, uh, and we'll make a series of recommendations to all three levels of government on how they can better represent young people in decision making. Now, why do all of this? Well, it's not easy being a young person in today's world. We're half of the world's population, yet 90% of us are living in developing countries. We're 40% of the world's unemployed. We're 40% of HIV infections globally. And about half of all young people are currently living on less than $2 a day. In Australia, young people are also facing fairly significant challenges. We're seeing housing and quality education becoming increasingly out of reach. It's harder than ever for us to find meaningful work in our field of interest, and our climate is more fragile than ever before, meaning our future is more uncertain than ever before. For the first time since World War II, our generation could very well be poorer than the one that came before. And what's worse is that many young people don't feel like they have a say in addressing these problems. Last year, less than half of the young people we spoke to felt as though their opinions were respected and valued by the community. We're often stereotyped and stigmatised, we're accused of being naive, lazy, complacent, smashed avo eating idealists. And while the smashed avo part might be true, the other character characterisations couldn't be further from the truth. In the last national census held in 2016, over 500,000 young people between 15 and 24 said they were doing some form of volunteer work. And 90% of all young people believed they could make the world a better place. Yes, there is a deep frustration among many young people in not feeling like their voices are being heard, but there is also a lot of hope. Almost every young person I've spoken with over my journey so far has conveyed an overwhelming sense of optimism about the future. One of the activities I run in my workshop is called a spectrum. Has anyone done a spectrum before? No? So basically, spectrum is a very simple idea. I'll pose a question or make a statement, and if people agree strongly with the statement, they'll stand on one side of the room, and if they disagree, they'll stand on another side of the room. If they're not sure, they'll stand in the middle, and if they're somewhere in between, they'll stand somewhere in between. I tend to make a number of statements, but one of them is, I feel optimistic about the future. And this statement is often met with mixed reactions from the young people that I speak to. I find most of the young people move towards the centre of the room. When I ask them why they've chosen to stand where they have, what is often expressed is a mixture of hope and fear. Hope and excitement about technology bringing us closer together and connecting us in ways we've never seen before. Right now, three billion people are connected online, and two billion of those people are accessing the internet via their phones. By the end of this decade, four billion people will be online. And all of those people will be connecting to the internet via their smartphones. That's one billion more people with ideas, with solutions, that have the networking power of the internet at their fingertips. Young people have hope in seeing the world become fairer. Life expectancy is up. The global inequality gap is closing. When we talk about poverty, the statistic that's often expressed is that roughly 10% of the world's population, or just over 750 million people, are living in extreme poverty. And that's true, and that's something that we need to continue to be aware of and address. But what often isn't talked about is that since 1990, that figure was, or sorry, that in 1990, that figure was 1.8 billion. So in just under 30 years, we've brought 1.1 billion people out of extreme poverty. Young people have hope in technology, bringing us, uh, helping us to eradicate disease and illness. Globally, more young people are living to see their fifth birthday than ever before. The WHO and, the, and UNICEF recently released their latest figures on child mortality last September. And what they show is that we've just had the 47th consecutive year where, child morta where the child morta mortality rate excuse me, has come down. We've saved the lives of 22 million children in the last 22 years. That's more people than have, who have been killed by all forms of war and violence in that period. That's the greatest news story of our time. 
and yet we don't tend to hear that much about it. Finally, young people, or so many young people, have hope in being a member of the most educated generation in history. In the 1970s, approximately half the planet could read and write. Today, that number is more than four-fifths in both areas. And most of the people who can't read and write are members of the older generations. So we're moving into a world where more people than ever are literate and have some form of schooling. That's an incredible achievement. It's something we should be celebrating. So many young people are looking at these changes and are hopeful about the future and their role in it. But there is also a great deal of uncertainty and fear. Fear that our environment will continue to deteriorate, that the wonder and beauty of the natural world that's been enjoyed by so many generations before us will cease to exist. Fear that we won't be able to find work uh, that we're passionate about and sustain that work. It now takes your average university graduate 4.2 years to find full-time work in their field of interest. The average 15-year-old will have 18 different jobs across five different careers. And right now, the youth unemployment rate in Australia is twice that of the standard unemployment rate. And perhaps most importantly, there is a great deal of fear in not being heard by our leaders. The, the second statement I tend to make during the spectrum activity is, I feel represented in politics. And in every consultation I've done so far, almost every young person has moved to the disagree side of the room. Of the 15,000 young people we spoke to last year, only 17% felt like their views were represented by, politi by politicians in government. And it's easy to see why. There is currently one MP under 30. One MP representing 4.9 million young Australians. And the average age of a federal minister is 48. At present, there is no peak body that represents young people at the federal level, and we don't have a minister for youth. Young people want to participate in important political, social, and cultural conversations, and they are. We're engaging in civil society in greater numbers than ever before. We're engaging in politics in new and exciting ways. We're building online campaigns, tackling important issues in our communities. We're attending protests on issues that we care about. We're making more conscious choices around what products we consume and more importantly, how those products are being produced. And we're using social media to share ideas and information and build movements to tackle injustice. We're not apathetic, complacent or disinterested. So many of us are speaking up every day. Our leaders just need to do a better job of listening. Not being heard is one of the scariest things. As young people, we're often told that we're the leaders of tomorrow. One day we'll be great scientists, innovators, artists. One day. What does that tell us? Not today. To the young people in the room, I'd encourage you all to reject that narrative. We are also the leaders of today, and we have the ability to affect positive change right now. All of you have already created ripples of positive change in your lives, probably without knowing it. How many of you volunteer or have volunteered before? That's a great tool for creating positive change. How many of you have made a social media post about something you care about? Yep, that's a tool for creating change. And how many of you have comforted a friend who was going through a hard time or feeling a bit down? Yep, that's such an important tool for creating change. And mental health and well-being was the top issue that came out of our consultations last year. When enough of us stand up and start to take actions like this, we become powerful agents of change. I've been deeply inspired by the conversations I've had with those 600 people so far. Yes, I'm at the beginning of my journey, but I'm really looking forward to hearing from the rest. Without fail, in every consult I have done, my expectations have been ex exceeded. The respect that so many of the young people I speak to have for each other, for each other's ideas, the way they encourage and listen to each other, their deep determination to solve problems, and the nuance and depth of those solutions continue to blow me away. I have no doubt that you know, if you were to come with me and, and speak to a lot of the young people, you guys would be blown away too. I've spoken with a, a lot of young people who are suffering from disadvantage. Young people who have been neglected, who have been left out, or who have been made to feel terrible because of who they are or what they look like. Young people who continue to experience racism and injustice every day. These young people have every right to be angry to be frustrated and to give up. 
but none of them have. When I've spoken with these young people, so many of them are still optimistic. They still want to make positive contributions and are determined to push forward and challenge those with prejudices. A big, po a big portion of our workshop is focused on building solutions to current problems. Young people will divide into groups uh, and come up with solutions to any problem that they feel affects them. It can be a big one, a small one, community problem, personal problem, anything. And almost all the time, all of the time, the solutions they come up with are not centred around them, but their community. Young people who have been through significant personal hardship, who are feeling disenfranchised or who aren't, uh, who, have, who, have, who have experienced uh, significant disenfranchisement, aren't just thinking, what can I do to make my life better, but what can I do to make the people's lives around me better? This sense of empathy, community and unity and collaboration is so needed right now. More and more we're seeing conversations about our differences rather than our common bonds. We're seeing people like Donald Trump dividing rather than uniting, labelling those who challenge him as fake. We're seeing a more short-sighted, selfish brand of leadership where the needs of the few are becoming more important than the needs of the many. A trend towards isolation rather than globalisation and cooperation. More than ever, the world needs more bridges, not more walls. As the next generation, it will be up to us to build those bridges. What I've seen and heard on my journey so far has given me a great sense of optimism about the future. At no other time in history has there been such a large population of young people so passionate, so capable and so connected to the world around them. Standing here talking to all of you, I can confidently say that there are so many young people out there who want to see a world that is more generous, more empathetic and less violent. As young people, as the leaders of today, not just tomorrow, as the next generation to inherit the world, it will be up to us to build that future together. Thank you.